not my job today. Today, my job is simply to introduce our second guest pastor. As you know, we're in our Voices series, where we get to hear from four different pastors in our presbytery um, from all across the Midwest um, that are part of our Pastor Steve's uh, Pastors Covenant group. These are our four guys that meet together on a regular basis and pray for each other and pray for each other's churches, um, hold each other accountable to things. And so they, they got together and they felt that the Holy Spirit was calling them to, to preach to each other's churches about what it looks like to live missionally. What does it look like to us for us to engage our community and to engage the people in our lives who don't know Jesus? How can we do that better? Um, so today I have the privilege of introducing Brian Jacobson from First Presbyterian Church in Oostburg, Wisconsin. It's about a block away from where my brother lives, which is, I think is really cool. Um, so Brian, thank you for, for being with us this morning. Thank you for making the drive down. We appreciate it, and we're excited to hear what the Holy Spirit's got for you to say to yeah, us. Yeah, I appreciate it, Micah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Hi, everybody. So that was a great introduction. Maybe nothing needs to be added except that uh, I have a wife named Courtney and a son named Theo who are still at the Holiday Inn taking advantage of the 11 o'clock checkout. So they'll be here later for the, uh, for the second service. Let's see. We were joking earlier how like every pastor's ear is a little bit different, and when you're borrowing his, the other person's earpiece, it can be a little tough. So if I cut out or anything, just, well, you're going you're to you're pretend like you don't know. But uh, I was thinking it's that thing that says one voice but a lasting impact. I'm like, I don't know. I, think there's, I don't think there's such things as great sermons, maybe, and I just decided this 20 seconds ago, so don't hold me to it, but I, maybe there's no such thing as great sermons. There's just people whose words you actually believe, right? I think that maybe is a better way of saying it. it, it you're going to decide whether what I say has credibility behind it by the end of this, and if you believe that there's credibility to what I say, you may just live it or not. It doesn't matter how good a sermon it, it is, frankly. It's whether my words find their way into your heart, and that I can't control, so I'm going to do my best anyways with what I've got, right? So I'm preaching this morning on bringing a knife to the gunfight. That, if you didn't know, is what's called an idiom in our English language. Uh, idioms are universal things. You find them all over in every kind of language. In fact, I've got several from other languages to share this morning. If you didn't know what an idiom is, we can put the definition on the screen. Don't bother reading it. I kind of wish I hadn't even included it. Here's what an idiom is. It's when the literal words of a phrase don't match the figurative way in which we use it. So here's an example. The first one I think I have on the screen behind me. I'm just going to go and, tr for the most part, I'm going to trust I have this thing memorized. And if I don't, then I'm going to turn around and look. And then you'll know I'm cheating. So I think what should be on the screen right now would be a stitch in time saves nine. How's that? That's an idiomatic phrase that, thank you, man. Appreciate that. Well, keep going, because it's going to get to the Japanese ones, and I'm going to have to turn around for sure. But a stitch in time saves nine, which means that when a garment frays at the seam and that first stitch comes loose, if you'll take care of it right away, you're not going to have to worry about the nine other stitches that are going to come undone as you leave the problem unhandled, right? So if you tackle a problem in due time, you don't have to worry about all the downstream consequences. A stitch in time saves nine. Or there's a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, another idiomatic phrase that we use, maybe in generations past, not so much now. But it essentially means that having something, like the, the tangible presence of a $10 bill in your hand is better than $20 out there somewhere, some promise that you're going to be able to get it, right? So having something in hand is better than the promise of a thing. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Now I'm going to start turning around because I forget where I go from here. Oh, a horse apiece. That's right, that's why I forgot, because this one is meaningless to anybody who lives outside of a tiny part of Wisconsin. Has any, have any of you heard of a horse apiece as an idiomatic phrase? Okay, it, thank you for those of you who have. Uh, I'd never heard it till I moved to Wisconsin. It apparently comes from a card game, maybe, where you get horses, and if you each have one, it's a horse apiece. And we use it as a phrase up in our parts to say, like, it's the same thing as six of one and half a dozen of the other. It's like, whatever comes next, it's all even. So just what happens next will be what decides it, a horse apiece. And then we have phrases like, oh, neati heone um kundule, which I don't even have to explain to any of you, right? <laughs> that is a, that's a Swahili idiom that I learned in college. I had a friend who moved to the States from Kenya, and I just pumped him for every idiom that I could get out of him because I love these things. That means a buffalo cannot see its own butt. That's what that means. And I like that because it speaks to the fact that we are all way better at seeing other people's problems than our own, 
right? We're all way better at picking up the things that other people do incorrectly than our own stink, as it were. Uh, how about this one? Oh, so last week I preached at, at, a, at another eco-church, obviously a historically Japanese-American congregation. So I stuck a couple Japanese ones in here thinking I was going to impress them. Lo and behold, most of them are like third and fourth generation, don't even speak Japanese. So it, what was great about that is that no matter how bad I butcher this, it wasn't going to matter. But I said it something like this, koketsu ni irazumba koji boezu, which means... Uh, is that really? So I have this one first, or was there another one? Was there another Japanese one? That's it? That's cool. I think what this one means is, because <laughs> I thought I had them memorized, but I think what this one means is, unless you go in the tiger's cave, you'll never catch its cub. Or like we might say, nothing ventured, nothing gained, or go big or go home, right? Like, if you don't, if you don't risk, you'll never have reward. That's what this thing says, I think. What's the next one? Let me see. Oh, I think we must have skipped one in there, but it's cool. There was another Japanese one that, whatever. So this one, then we have these idioms that speak to the idea of readiness. So get your ducks in a row. This is one we mostly know, right? None of us have literal ducks. We just mean get your affairs in order. Line things up. Be thoughtful about the way you organize whatever it is you're about to tackle because that'll help you get it done in a more, I hate this word, by the way, increasingly, I hate this word, efficient way. Efficiency, I don't think, is part of the kingdom of God, frankly. Think how inefficient the creation of the universe was or saving your soul. Not efficient at all because God had to spend everything for it. But, okay, so another one, crossing the T's and dotting the I's. Let's just keep going because they, they get where we're headed. This, this idea of readiness, like have we prepared everything? Have we finished all the little details to be prepared? Next one, I believe, is our one that we're aiming at. That's this one that speaks to a, a thorough lack of preparation, right? Bringing a knife to a gunfight means that you show up thoroughly unprepared to deal with the, the circumstances that are in front of you. And maybe the most common, or not the most common, but maybe a, a famous example of this comes from a movie clip, sort of a, an actual scimitar to a gunfight movie clip from Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. This just can be like a very short clip, but what's maybe a fun detail as you think about it and as we watch it together is that Apparently, uh, Harrison Ford was ill the day they shot this. He had a stomach ache. It was the end of a long day of shooting. He wasn't supposed to do what he does. He was supposed to take the whip out and do a bunch of stuff with it, and he was just so tired at the end of the day of shooting that he did this and exemplified for us what it looks like to bring a knife to a gunfight. Yeah, that's why you don't, that's the, that's the example of why you don't bring a knife or a scimitar, or it doesn't matter how, how impressive the blade is, right? It could be a nine-foot sword and it wouldn't matter. You're going to lose this particular altercation. And, and it strikes me, the reason I think about all these idioms, and in particular the one about the lack of preparedness and bringing a knife to a gunfight, is that I think most Christians experience their faith in this way, especially when we try and bring it to bear on the world around us. Most of us, I think, feel sort of outmanned, outgunned, underprepared as we go out into the world and we say, how do I bring my faith to bear out there, not just in this place? How is it that I interact with the world in a way that, that, that brings influence and, and brings the Jesus I know and love out there in a meaningful and relevant way? I think I, my experience as a pastor of now 16 years approximately is that most of us feel like we're the guy with the scimitar in our hands. And it's interesting to me as I think about that because uh, the scriptures explicitly tell us that it is our job to do this very thing, to, to take what this means to us and all that Christ has done for us and then bring it to bear in our relationships and our business and literally everything we do and every choice we make. And in particular, in, our, in the relationships we have with people who don't yet know the, the promises that we do. We see that borne out in our scripture this morning from 1 Peter, and in particular, verse 15, where we read, always be prepared, sorry, this microphone, just crazy, always be prepared to give an answer 
to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Now, you see I've got some numbers there. That's really just my way of keeping track. And the ones that you probably don't recognize are Japanese numbers. Again, me trying to impress the congregation last week. Apparently, I should have put Scottish numbers up there for this church. Is that right? Um, <laughs> so, so I just want to break down the scriptures for us a little bit because it can be helpful to understand what's being said. Uh, I shouldn't have messed with it. I should have just left it how I had it. It's cool. You're just going to keep seeing me fumble with it, and I'm going to keep drawing attention to it in a distracting way. That word always. Here, go back to that one just for a second, please, the previous one. So here's what's interesting about the, the, the New Testament was originally written in Greek, and here's what's fascinating about the Greek word behind that word always. I looked it up, and it means always. Uh, which is a really interesting translation into our English language because always means something like every time or without fail, meaning that the expectation of Peter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is that we might always, every time, without fail, be doing something. Here's another uh, passage in the New Testament where this same Greek word is used. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 4, 11, just the first part of it, we read, yes, Paul says, yes, we, as in me and my friends, live, me and my Christian friends live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus. Now, that would be a way of kind of getting your faith on fire, I would think. Uh, but that word constant right there is exactly the same word as in 1 Peter chapter 3 where he says always. So let's go back to our passage. So constantly, without fail, every single time, Peter says, do what? Be prepared. This be prepared, the word behind that means to live in a state of readiness. Here's another example of where that's used. Jesus sends his disciples ahead of him to find the upper room where they're going to have the last supper. And he says, you're going to find a man who's going to lead you to this upper room, and it will be already set up. This man will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That's where you should prepare your meal. Same Greek word as be prepared, already set up a state of readiness, meaning they didn't have to go up there and set the table. They didn't have to go up there and get the cushions put together. They didn't have to go up there and make sure that everything was where it was needed to be. It was already in a state of readiness to receive them. So let's go back to our passage. Always, every time, without fail, constantly live in a state of readiness to do what? To give an answer, he says. To give an answer to everyone. So here's another passage where this give an answer shows up. Jesus says that to his disciples, when you're brought to trial in the synagogues and before rulers and authorities, don't even worry about how you're going to, you see, defend yourself. Don't worry about how you're going to answer. Don't worry about how you're going to articulate your faith. Don't worry about the words that you're going to use. The Holy Spirit will teach you at the right time what needs to be said. Same words. So let's go back to our passage with some more understanding then. So always, every time, without fail, constantly live in a state of readiness to do what? to articulate the reason you believe, to give words to the person and relationship that you trust the most. In fact, here's how he puts it. To answer everyone who asks, to give the reason for the hope that you have. I love this next passage because it, it kind of ties all that together. Hebrews 10.23 says this, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. So same word, hope. And then here he ties it in for us. Pardon, sorry. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. Hope means an expectation of good. Why can we as Christian people have an expectation of good? Because we can trust God to keep his promises. That's why. So again, let's go back. We're kind of getting the amplified version as we go through this. What is it that Peter is saying? He's saying that always, without fail, constantly, every single time you are given opportunity Live in a state of readiness to articulate your faith or our faith and speak to the reason we can have an expectation of good in this world. That's what's being said. And yet, as I commented earlier, it's my, ex it's my experience, my lived experience and my observation that many of us as Christians live in a state of unreadiness or feel a total lack of preparation when it comes to bringing our faith to bear outside these walls. And the question might be, why is that? And what can we do about it? How do we, how do we address that? Uh, there's, there's a man named Tom Rainier. He is a, 
kind of a guy who resources churches. He does, he does surveys and things. And on his Twitter feed, he asked his however many thousand followers, he said, why do you think the church isn't doing this in the way that we perceive it might once have done these things? Why is it that Christians today seem so reticent to bring their faith to bear, to articulate what they believe, to be, quote-unquote, witnesses for Jesus outside the walls of the church? And, and his thousands of Twitter followers responded, and they gave reasons. And he compiled all those and put them into 15 reasons why we don't share our faith. And I'm just going to share the top 10, kind of 10 through 1. And this is Christians reporting on Christians now. This isn't some critic from outside the church. This isn't some pastor looking down from on high. These are people just like you responding and saying, why don't we do these things? I'll have a couple to add, but the the first one that that he says, number 10, that's the Japanese letter for 10. I really had to check in at some point in the series. I was like at number 8 last week, and I think, I think I'm on number 8 here, but I don't know for sure. That's the number 10, though. Our churches are no longer houses of prayer equipped to reach the lost. That was Christians reporting on Christians on why we don't do this, on why it seems like so many of us are uh, uh, kind of fighting with a a knife when the world's bringing guns. We're no longer houses of prayer. We'll go through this pretty quickly. Many church members don't really believe that Christ is the only way of salvation. Frankly, this is why we left our former denomination. I don't know why you did it, but I'm guessing for much the same reason. We We were connected with a fellowship of churches where this was an active debate. And we just weren't interested in that kind of debate. We wanted it to be a settled thing. But there are churches where that happens. Church members are in a retreat mode as culture becomes more worldly and unbiblical. I hear this one all the time. Brian, it's just harder out there. People people are less receptive. There are so many alternatives. People just don't have bandwidth to even listen. I get all that. It's just an excuse, though, and I'm going to come hard at you later. In fact, I'll just prep you right now. Uh, If if your toes are at all sensitive, you might want to put some steel toes on. I'm going to come at you so hard later. This is the fun part of the sermon. Uh, Church membership today is more about getting my needs met rather than reaching the lost. I'll bet any of us who would be honest would say amen to that about ourselves. Uh, Let's keep going. Many church members think that evangelism is the role of the pastor and paid staff. Yeah, I'll bet some of you sitting here think that. Uh, Let's keep going. Our churches have an ineffective evangelistic strategy of you come rather than we go. Yeah, right? Like if we could only get them in these doors. You know, it reminds me of how I spent, I, I became a Christian at 18 and I spent about the next decade praying for Tiger Woods. You see how well that went, right? <laughs> and I was just praying for Tiger Woods because I was like, if he got saved, the world could get changed because he's got a big platform and a big influence. And if only he, and I feel like it's the same attitude that church people have. You look at me like, if only Brian would be out there changing people's lives with his message. I'd be like, whew, you're putting on me the same stuff I put on Tiger Woods. Let's just hope I don't end up like he does, right? We are more known for what we're, what we're against than what we're for. I hear this a lot when I'm out in the world. Um, out, out in the world. I mean talking with non-Christian people, you know. Many Christians and church members are lazy and apathetic. That was the third reason that we gave ourselves, FYI. That's not me picking on anybody. That's church members saying like, yeah, we'd rather be golfing. Um, Many Christians and church members do not befriend and spend time with lost persons. If I was going to put my finger on the scale of, I think two and one are actually where I'd put two and one almost. I mean, the fact is, I'll bet some of us just don't even have non-Christian friends. We may have non-Christian, non-Christian acquaintances. We may have people who don't know Jesus that kind of orbit our lives. But very few of us have people we're investing in in terms of a real friendship, like the kind where you show up when people need you and they show up when you need them that kind of thing. And then Christians have no sense of urgency to reach lost people. That's the number one reason that we gave ourselves. Now, I added a couple to this list that are based in my experience. Uh, So there's Brian's uh, reasons we don't share. I'd say we're too busy. We're too, too much in a hurry. We just live our lives. I've just been so enamored. Enamored is really not the word. I mean, I'm enamored with the idea, but it's such a difficult one for me to wrap my mind around. Most of us live out of phase, like our soul is either constantly out ahead of our body or out behind it. Very few of us live a fully embodied, like ensouled life where we're present to the moment. That's a big deal in this this reality. And then the second thing I would add is that we we say we don't know how. I'll tell you as a pastor, if there's one thing I've heard over and over, it's, Brian, if, if you would just teach me how to do evangelism, if you would just teach me 
how to bring my faith to bear. If you would teach me how to do this, then I would sh for sure be doing it. And I guess this will be my first attempt at smashing some toes. I just think you're lying when you say that. I just don't believe you. I don't believe anybody who tells me that. I used to tell myself that. So I used to believe me, and now I'm calling myself out too. Because you're going to see at least with where I head from here why I think that's just not a realistic excuse for any of us, that we just don't know how. I'll tell you why in a moment, but I forget where I, what I say next, so I'll tell you what I say next when I see the slide. Oh, yeah, good. Here's why I think we actually don't. So those are the reasons that we self-reported, and a lot of them are really good reasons. And in fact, there's a lot of overlap you'll see with the reasons we give and the reasons that ultimately I try and summarize for us. But honestly, I think that one of the reasons most of us don't bring our faith to bear on the world outside these walls is because we're more afraid of the judgment of people than we are of the judgment of God. We're more concerned about our reputations. We're more concerned about our social media following. We're more concerned with how people perceive us. We're more concerned with the kinds of consequences that can be brought to bear upon us by the people around us than we are by God. And Jesus says, don't fear the one who can only put your body to death. That's a scary thing to think about. I, I, I've been watching the news as Christian brothers are being beheaded in the Middle East, and I think to myself, do I have that? Do I have enough fear of the Lord in me that I could face even that? I don't know if you saw that African pastor who they did a video of him. It was supposed to be his like ransom video and he just sat there the whole time talking about the goodness of God and how God must have wanted him there. And he just prays that God looks over his family if he never makes it back. So he made the video. He's been beheaded since then. He's been executed since. There's a man who feared the Lord more than people. And I just think there's so many of us who have not counted the cost and decided what's actually worth giving up and what isn't. And most of us just blindly sort of accept the price of our lives in exchange for the call of God. And we say, as long as I'm comfortable and happy and my home is good and my cars aren't breaking down, I'm doing okay. I think the other reason is, and frankly, if I was going to just do one, if I wanted to summarize the whole thing, I'd say this, is just we just don't love people. The reason most of us don't bring our faith to bear outside these walls is frankly because we don't love. If we loved, we would bring our faith to bear. And this is why I don't believe people when they say, Brian, if you would just teach us, we would do it. Because it's not a knowledge issue. I reflect back on when I was falling in love with my wife, Courtney, and I, I realized that no single person had to ask me um, Brian, do you know what pleases her? Brian, do you know what Courtney loves and makes her happy? Brian, uh, have you thought about Courtney and meeting her needs today? You know why nobody had to ask me those things? Because I was like passionately pursuing the answer to them. Nobody had to be like, what does Courtney love? I'm like, oh, I'm on the case. I am on the case of what Courtney loves because as soon as I identify that, I'm going to try and give it to her in abundance Right? Not a single person had to hold my hand for that. Had I ever fallen in love before? No. Did I know how to act when I was falling in love? Sure didn't. Did I know how to please a woman? Clueless. But I investigated. You couldn't have held me back. And what I observe about Christians is that we say, if you'd only teach me, and I think, no, it's because you don't love. Because if you loved, I wouldn't even be able to hold you back from reaching people with the gospel. If we loved lost people, we would not be stoppable. Sorry, I got excited. And then it's just not a priority, right? Like, here's another difficult truth. You know, I would, I, what I really want is for your toes to be fully exposed so you feel the full pain of this, and maybe it'll change the way you live. But the fact is, here's an observation that is rooted in truth, whether we accept it or not. Every single person in this place lives their priorities. 
Every single one of us lives our priorities. So I don't, I don't want to hear anymore that you don't know how. I don't want to hear that um, if only you had more time. If only there was another hour in the day for sure. If only work wasn't demanding so much. If only, if only. No, everything that matters to you, everything that matters to me, I make time for. Fact. So if, if you're not bringing your faith to bear in the lives of people who aren't Christians, it's just not a priority for you, period. If it was, you'd make time. If it was, you'd, you'd, you'd scrape out other things. If you loved, I'm sorry, it's a lot of you language. I'm not, it's not like, well, I'll just show you. I don't have this together, brothers and sisters. This isn't you because I, I'm perfect at any of this. This is we and us and me. I don't want to act like I've had this together. I, I'm coming off a sabbatical where I feel like for the first time in a decade I'm a healthy person. And for the first time in maybe my whole adult and Christian life I'm actually living the truths of the things I'm talking to you about. Not, no, not fully. I was confessing to someone before the service that I spent all day yesterday being a jerk to every person I care about. So, um, what do I say next? Oh, what we can do to get ready. How about let's put them all three on the board because I bet I've talked a long time. Um, so, I mean, I'll just I'll say that number one is maybe the most significant thing you could do that we can do. If we could set aside unhurried time and what I'll just tell you what that looks like in my life, that's like 45 minutes to an hour for me. It's unhurried. <laughs> unhurried requires time. So on a regular basis, I make unhurried time to spend time in God's Word. I don't do it to come up with sermons. I don't do it to, to like get a little boost for my spiritual life. I don't do it to find some application that I can walk out. I do it simply to connect with the one who inspired the word. I do it simply to get close to God and say, as I read the Bible, let it read me. The only way that happens is in an unhurried way. Uh, cultivating actual friendships with people who aren't Christians. <laughs> I mean, if you want to bring your faith to bear in a meaningful way in somebody's life to the point where they then tr try on your Christianity a little bit. I was talking with this guy Tom in the shop. One day a week I, I work in a shop, a uh, wood shop, doing like rough carpentry and stuff. It's been the biggest blessing in my life because I get to actually be around people who, don't, who aren't Christians. Otherwise I'm just like suffocating in Christianity all the time. And, uh, and this guy Tom, the other day, after four hours of us listening to Tom talk about how he views reality and his experience and how he conceives of what's true and not. The next morning we were talking and Tom's like, he's not a Christian. And he said, Brian, he's like, after that, he said, I was talking with Phil and he said, I realized that all of a sudden I was channeling you in the way I answered him. And I was like, well, that's because you and I are resonating at the same level, Tom. I was like, you're ready to be a Christian, man. <laughs> like, there's hardly anything holding you back, man. Now he's not there yet. But it's exciting, and I was saying before the service that uh, the fact that, that I'm making a disciple and not a convert means that when Tom does give his heart and his life, I'm not going to be able to hold him back. It's not going to be like, oh, Tom, are you a singer or are you a greeter? Because those are the two roles we have in the church. That's not what it's going to have to be. I don't even know if Tom will set foot in the church. But what he will do once he comes to know the love of Christ and he's been discipled by a couple Christians is that we're, he's just going to be unleashed without us having to do a thing. And that's an awesome thing to think about. So, and then practice, I say. Practice because that's, uh, that's how we get better at things. That's how we learn how to fail with grace. And frankly, more often than not, what I've found is that when I fail in front of the people in my life, that's when they seem to listen most. So I don't know what else I have. Do I end with anything else? Oh, I think I say, if we do all these things, <laughs> it's a little cheesy, right? Like it's just that simple. It's so simple. Just spend unhurried time in God's word, make friendships with non-Christians, and then practice. So simple. All it's going to require is for you to totally reorient your entire life around what God asks you to do. Amen. Shall we pray? <laughs> Lord, all of this is so much easier said than done. Um, so much easier articulated than walked. And... Most of us, uh, many of us just frankly aren't all that interested. I, I know that because 
how long it, it took me 20 years to even have ears to hear it. So to whatever extent people are feeling pressure from me, let it be pressure from you. To whatever extent things I said were unprofitable, let them fall away. Because we're looking for you and you alone. And we want to see our lives and our faith brought to bear on people outside. So help us do that, we pray. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.